Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Love, Truth, and Spirit Ministries. We're so blessed to have you here today. We're so blessed to share the Word of God with you. We're, let's open up in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence in our hearts, minds, and souls, in our buildings, Father, in our homes today, Lord. Uh, forgive us of our sins so we may come to your throne of grace with a righteous mind and a righteous heart, Father. The sins of anger, the sins of of just... Uh, you know, getting caught up in the world, Father, if you have uh, addictions, Lord God in heaven, please forgive us of those those sins that we uh, commit on a daily basis, unintentional and intentional, Lord, because we know as you we seek your forgiveness, you forgive us, we can forgive others, Father God in heaven. So thank you for that. I want to pray for President Trump and uh, thank you, Father, just give you thanks and all glory that you protected that man. Father God in heaven, we know the ultimate outcome of the enemy, and that is to destroy what you are building up, Father. But we can see with clear eyes, Father, that your hands are around this man, Lord God in heaven. So continue to protect him, protect his family, Father God in heaven, and continue to expose the evil, Father. Light that fire in us, Father, to stand together, not as a nation, but as one body in Christ. Father, because the body of Christ is greater than the nation that we live in, Lord God in heaven. So my prayer is that we would reunite as a body in Christ, Father, and join together in prayer to smite the evil, Father. Again, call on your Holy Spirit to fight our battles, Father God. Your mighty angels, send them here, send them now, Father God. So your name can be glorified father so we just thank you for this in jesus mighty name amen so we're gonna jump into a new book now and it's gonna take us quite a while to get through it i suspect there's 16 chapters so we're gonna jump into the book of romans which you know it's been on the docket to, for me to preach in the book for well over a year and you know it just uh it's an exciting book it's uh, one of the largest books that Paul has penned uh, in the New Testament. So, and he has a lot to say. And so when he has a lot to say, and when I say he, Paul, I really mean God is speaking through Paul. So there's a lot to be said. God has a strong message for us, for us all. And, you know, I think it's a, an appropriate time to really start and delve in and deep dive into the book of Romans because it not only addresses the mature Christian, but it also addresses, addresses uh, the new Christian and those who are wavering on a fence. So it, uh, from a doctrinal or a theological perspective, it's all about Jesus, and it's all about coming together as a body, you know, even though you're Jewish, even though you're a Christian, or if you're a Gentile, you know, Paul is saying it time, the time is now to come together. And as we witnessed last night, the time is now for us to come together. We need to come together as a body of Christ. We need to have one voice. We need to represent the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what goes on around us, no matter how we feel about other people, we need to follow God's instruction. How do we treat people? How respectful are we to others? How do we love our neighbor? This is what God teaches us. This is what God is speaking into us. This is how the Holy Spirit convicts us when we stray from those basic pr principles. And we really, really need to get back to the basics of, of Jesus Christ, of focusing on Jesus, focus on God, and focus where the focus really needs to be internally in ourselves. When we're harboring hatred, when we're harboring ill will towards others, when we have a sense of excitement because someone almost dies. I mean, those are feelings from Satan. They're not from God. God tells us to love our neighbors. God tells us to put no idols before him. God tells us to love him with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. 
God tells us to serve him. And this is what Paul's message is about in the book of Romans. Is serving God, doing what God has asked him to do, to get out with an eagerness to preach the gospel, the good news. What is the good news? The good news is Jesus Christ. In the first century, the good news has always been Jesus Christ. In the second century, third century, so on, so forth, 21st century, what is the good news? The good news is Jesus Christ. The better news is, if you're a true believer, Jesus is going to come and take his church, take his bride. We will be with him and his Father in heaven for eternity. That's the even better news. But let's start out with the good news because Paul is eager. He's eager to go into Rome. He's eager to preach the, preach the gospel of Jesus as we're going to see. But there are other uh, things that we need to really focus on also as we start to delve into the book. So the question I have for you is this. Have you ever been really excited to share the word of God? Have you ever been going on a vacation or something, maybe visiting some family out of state somewhere, and you're so anxious to see them, but more importantly, you're anxious to see them to share the word of God with them because God has spoken into your heart. You have made the decision to receive Jesus. You have for so long put him on the back burner. Now you've brought him into your fore into your line of sight now you want to follow Jesus now you're excited to read the word of God you're excited to see how God is moving in your life you're excited to see how God is training you up through the Holy Spirit to recognize the fruits of the Spirit to recognize God's word to understand the principles of the Bible and you just can't wait to share that how God has worked in your life, how God is changing your life, how God is working in your family's life, how opportunity after opportunity, once you've made that final decision, God brings to you so you can share the word of God. If you're in that state right now, or if you've been in that state for a long, long time, you are the perfect evangelist for Christ. Because it's a yearning that you have. It is a dedication that we need to have towards God the Father, Jesus the Son. Through the Holy Spirit, as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, as we're reading His Word, the Holy Spirit pours into us, helps us interpret what God is trying to teach us. Brings to our remembrance the words of Jesus, the teachings. That's evangelism. Paul was an evangelist. Paul was a pastor. Paul was a teacher. Paul was, was very well versed in Old Testament and Jewish tradition teachings. Paul came very quickly to understand what God's instructions to him were through the Lord Jesus Christ and what to teach. And we can all be like that. We can't be a Paul. God is going to gift us in so many different ways. He's going to gift us in ways that we cannot imagine. But when we seek the Lord, when we seek the gifts that he offers to us, and then we realize this is how God wants to give, gift us. This is how God wants us to move within uh, his ministry. Then we will see an effect of, of his movement in others like we've never seen before. And Paul has been doing this since that time on the road to Damascus when Jesus called him and called him to do what? To preach the gospel, the gospel of Jesus. And God calls all of us. We're all called, by the way, to preach the gospel of Jesus. Now, am I saying everybody's called to be a preacher? No. Is everybody called to be a teacher? No. Is everybody, does everybody have the gifts of helps? No. Does everybody have the different gifts that are mapped out to us in, the, in Corinthians? No. God will gift us individually, and he knows our personalities. He knows what we can do, what we can handle, what we can't handle, and he'll give us the appropriate gift. 
The key is you need to find that gift. Paul found his gift. His gift, he thought, in the Jewish traditions was to bash Christians, to go out and destroy the Christian church, to destroy everything that surrounded Jesus. But guess what? God had a different plan, a much, much different plan for Paul. And it took that divine moment on the road to Damascus where Paul was dropped to his knees and he had a vision. He seen Jesus and he seen Jesus for who he truly is. This is why the transformation didn't take any time. Yes, it took time for Paul to unlearn some of the things that he has learned to change his behaviors. It took a lot of time for him to build in the Christian community confidence that he was not out to get the Christian anymore. He wasn't against Jesus. He was for Jesus. All that took time, but Paul persevered through it, through the trials, through the temptations, through uh, the persecutions. Paul did it. You and I can do the same thing. Paul did it because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. You and I can do it because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. That's how we get through. And it's an important point to understand when we're trying to build a life, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our understanding of what that relationship looks like may be a little bit differently than the relationship that Jesus wants to have with us. We may think, well, we need to be stuck in the world. We need to stay connected to the world because that's we're the conduit between Jesus and the world. And in some cases, that's true because God, like I said, Jesus will give us what we can handle and no more. But when we decide to take on more and take on more without seeking the Lord first, without stopping, waiting, listening to God, following his instruction, following the path that he's put before us, then we'll get ourselves in a lot of trouble. And we see this and, you know, we're going to see this in Romans uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 15, where Paul mentions that he has been wanting to go to Rome, but he was held back. Because it wasn't God's time to send him to Rome. It may not be your time or my time if we have these big grandioso uh, ministry uh, organizations we want to put together and we think that just because we're preaching the word of God, people will come in droves. We see that that doesn't take place. It's God's time. It's God's methods. It's God's will that people will come to Christ. And if we're in his will and we're doing his will and we're staying focused on him, then we can see the fruition of the ministry that he's given to us. Paul is a good example. He never tried to get ahead of God because he knew the importance of following and not leading. And that's where we need to be. We need to be followers of Jesus Christ. We can't lead. How can we lead a God that knows everything, that is everywhere present, omnipresent, omniscient, all-knowing? How can we lead someone like that? We follow. And that's the beauty of what we're going to start seeing when we break down Romans. And it's going to be, there's, Paul gives us some good, good teachings. And it may be hard on some ears. But I will tell you this. Once we get through this book, you'll have a better understanding from a young Christian to a mature Christian what that relationship with Christ really means to you and I and to the whole world. <laughs> and again, it's apropos that we're in a, an environment, a political environment, where people would rather see death to someone else than to try to uplift and try to pray for them. You know, as a Christian, you know, my call to my brothers and sisters in Christ are that we band together as one body so we can pray. We can pray against the evil. We see 
be evil if you're a true believer because God gives us discernment to see. And as we see, as we seek the Lord even more, I believe that we are in a spot, in a position to where we can see the evil that surrounds us. And we can navigate through it. How do we navigate through this evil? On our knees. In prayer. In fellowship with other true believers. To exhort, to uplift each other, to encourage each other. Because it is dark. And it is getting darker. So we need to be in that position. Now, as dark as it is, that doesn't prevent God from calling you to share his word. He calls us, you know, the, uh, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20 tells us to go out and make disciples, baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to share God's word. And if we use Paul as an example, we see how Paul was building the church. He was instrumental in building the church. He was instrumental in instructing the church. He was instrumental in correcting the church. If it was good enough for the first century, and by the way, it's not just for the first century, but this is in real time what Paul was doing. He didn't have the whole depth and breadth of the Bible that he was teaching. He was penning letters. He was sending people out to read letters, and then he would follow up in person in a lot of cases to show his presence, that he was backing everything that he was teaching. We need to get into that position where when we're being taught, do we back up what we're being taught with our words, with our actions? We can see today there are a lot of people that profess to be Christians that won't walk the walk, but they do talk the talk. And I'll tell you, you know what? Uh, words without actions, as James reminds us, is meaningless. We need action to back up what we're doing. If we are true believers and we see the evil around us, we should be in prayer we should be in prayer every day. We should be praying against the evil. In another time, I will tell you, I'll share with you how and where this evil is coming from. We know the where, Satan. We know the how. He's infiltrated, you know, people's lives. And they're using their lives and their livelihood and their riches and their perceived fame to try to dictate that evil upon everyone else. Why? Because that's Satan's plan. Satan's plan is to destroy what God has created. And we can see that in some cases it is successful, but if God's got his arms around you, his hands around you, it's not going to happen. And we know this. Why? Because we know God. <laughs> we know who God is. We know the strength and power of God. So let's get into Romans, and then we'll get into some background. I want to read the scripture. We'll, we'll talk about it as we go through. So Romans 1, and we'll start out with 1 through 7. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before uh, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says a lot there, and again, it's typical of his opening letters. You know, he comes in with a greeting. Greeting, I am Paul, 
you know, and what does Paul say? Again, he uses the same term we've learned in Ephesians and in other letters that he wrote. He's a bondservant, a slave, a slave for Christ. But he also has to remind these mature Christians in Rome, he is called to be an apostle. Now, if we recall, what does it take to be a, of an, an apostle? One of the key tenets to becoming an apostle or being an apostle is you are witness, direct witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. But you're going to say, well, Paul's ministry started way after the crucifixion of Christ. But remember, the road to Damascus, Jesus appeared before Paul, which qualifies him. And there's a lot of argument on that, but we won't go delve down that. That's for a Bible study time. But for now, Paul qualifies himself to be an apostle. What? Separated to the gospel of Jesus. What does that mean, separated? Separated from the world to the gospel. Right? Separated from his old life to the gospel, to preaching the gospel. He was excited to do it, which he promised before through his prophets, the Holy Scripture. Now, Paul does something very interesting here. He pulls in the Old Testament. He is making an argument that the Old Testament is critical and it ties directly to the New Testament. So those of you who have heard that the Old Testament has no relevance in today's environment, you're just being taught wrongly. And you really need to question or challenge those statements. If you're hearing them, if you're sitting in a church where you're hearing the Old Testament has no more relevance to today, that's just heresy and that's false teaching. And you need to really seek the Holy Spirit through prayer and fasting and ask the Lord to give you a discernment for the truth itself. So Paul is bringing the Old Testament in concerning his son Jesus. Our Lord was born of the seed of, of David according to the flesh. Now why is he saying born of the seed of David? Because it's so important for us as Christians, one of the foundational blocks in our Christianity is the lineage of Jesus and where he came from because it was prophesied that he would come through uh, Judea. He would come through the lineage of David. So Paul's reminding the Roman church and whoever else has ears to hear. He's reminding you and I that Jesus came from that lineage. It's important and it's going to be more important as we see and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, what's the spirit of holiness? That's the Holy Spirit in us. Jesus was raised from the dead through the Holy Spirit. God put his spirit and breathed life into Jesus and raised him from the dead. Just like we learned last week in Ezekiel with the dry bones, that God breathes life into each one of us and he'll raise us from the dead. If we allow him to, if we are have enough courage to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to live my life for you, no matter what it takes, no matter how I'm persecuted, I am going to trust in you. I'm going to put my trust in you. This is what Paul is telling everybody. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among the nations for his name. <coughs> Excuse me. It's through our obedience. It's through our faith. And we get our obedience. We get our faith through Christ. As Christ is calling us. He's filling us with the Holy Spirit. And we become more obedient. More obedient. We become more faithful. As we go through trials in our lives, it happens more and more and more. Among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. All who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it's an awesome welcoming. And we know one thing, out of all the letters that Paul penned, his opening remarks here are... are uh, 93 words. 
which parallels the next opening, which is much less. So let's look at, he's called Kletos, pertaining to having been called, called. Paul proclaims Jesus to be the Son of God. Here and elsewhere, Paul writes from Corinth when he's penning this letter, and we'll get into the history a little bit in a, in a few minutes here. Let's look at 1, 8 through 15 now. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for, all, for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you, for I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that y you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So, as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Again, there's a lot going on here. Ophelio is a debtor. To be under obligation, be obligated to do something. And this is the prologue of the thanksgiving. So we have the greeting, we have the thanksgiving. Again, 93 different words that Paul's using in this opening. And I believe he's doing it because he is already w walking into an established church. The Romans were establishing churches all over the place, Christian churches. People knew the gospel but he had to establish himself. And this is why he gives, I think, such a long opening and a long thanksgiving. But what does he say? I might find the way and the will of God for you. Four, uh, let me start at eight. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. So what is he telling us here? He's giving us a means to thank God, and it is through Jesus Christ. When we pray, what do we say? In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Jesus tells us if we pray in his name, those things that we pray for in the will of God, he will give to us. So, again, Paul is putting Jesus in the middle between him and God. Because Paul knows that's the hierarchy that God has determined to be the right hierarchy. Jesus Christ is our intermediary. He is the one that God has given to us. So we may have a better relationship with God the Father. We have someone that we can go to in our prayers. We have someone that we can go to to speak to his Father on our behalf. It says, for God is my witness. What is he saying here? He's telling these people, trust me. He's using, for God is my witness. I, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention to you. So what he's trying to do is, is really emphasize that yes, I am praying for you. I said I was praying for you. As God is my witness, I am praying for you. It sets the stage and the foundation to trust and verify. Paul is asking to trust and verify. Not only see his actions, I'm sure when he was there praying in the synagogues and praying in the churches for people, but he's also stating it. So his words and his actions must uh, connect, just like your words or my words and our actions must connect. There must be a 
a connection between our words and actions that point directly to God, that point to God through Jesus Christ. It says, making a request, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. So he's again, I mentioned this earlier, he's seeking God's will that I can come to you. And I'll tell you, when we step outside of God's will, uh, things don't always work out the way they should. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by mutual faith, both of you and me. If we're both faithful, if you're faithful in prayer, I'm faithful in prayer, and we're praying for the same things, and our faith comes together, God will hear those faithful prayers. He will answer in His own way through our faith, through our prayers. I, now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often plan to come but to, uh, to you, but was hindered until now. We know Paul was pretty busy. He was pretty busy penning other letters, visiting other churches, trying to thwart the heresies and the false teachings. He was pretty busy, but now God gave him opportunity. And we see that the opportunity is going to come to an end eventually because he eventually gets martyred and beheaded in Rome. And this is really important here now. 14 is really the beginning of uh, the theme here. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So what does he mean there? He is a debtor. He is under obligation from all, from God to preach to all. He's obligated to do something. God and Jesus Christ has obligated him. And he's standing up. He's a stand-up guy. We know Paul. We know his personality. We know his determination. That's why God chose him. Are you determined? Or are you going to cower in a corner and allow someone else to dictate your walk with Christ. You're going to let someone dictate how you worship Christ. I hope not. So let's start breaking this down. Eager to spread the good news is the message today. Romans 1, 1 through 15. So continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Paul gives us that continuity, Romans 1, 1 through 4. He shows where Jesus, the lineage of Jesus, he talks about the prophets that were prophesying Jesus. The importance of the Old Testament. We're called to be saints. We're all called to be saints. Romans 1, 5 through 7. Anxious and praying for you. <laughs> Excuse me. Romans 1, 8 through 13. Paul was anxious to get there. He's been praying. God finally opened the door. I'm excited to see you all. And this is Paul's walk off in this section here. I'm excited to see you all. Romans 14 and 15. He can't wait to get out there. He can't wait to evangelize. But we're going to find out there's some motivation uh, surrounding it. But it's all pointing to God. Paul's motivation is all pointing to God the Father and His mission. What His mission is uh, to serve God, to get the gospel of Jesus out. Let's look. Reasons for Romans. So we're going to get into a little bit of background here. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I think there's a lot of meat that we still need to go through. Reasons for Romans, okay? So Paul's defense and self of self and his ministry. So the reason why he was going to Rome to defend himself and the ministry that he's been given by God, by Jesus. And he has to, he has to you know, self-defend. Again, everybody in the region, in Asia Minor, knew Paul, knew of Paul, knew what Paul was capable of. And, and I'm sure it took a long time for the disbelief 
to wane for Paul to convince everybody he was doing God's will. The second uh, is seeking ministry to support, uh, ministry support to go to Spain. Now there's a lot of talk out there, theologians uh, talking about, you know, Paul, he, he had his eyes on Spain. He seen a rich mission field in Spain and Paul wanted to get there. And so he was looking at, you know, if he was in Antioch or where he uh, was set up his home base and he would have to travel to Spain, that was a long, long distance. So some believe that Paul wanted to set up something in Rome so he was close enough to the ministry field in Spain. Aiding the Roman Christian church. You know, who would not want a Paul to come in periodically and preach to the congregation and share the wisdom that God is imparting upon him. This was the same thing. Paul thought he could go in and support the church in more ways than one. You know, it was a win-win scenario. Paul would get the ability to make a base in Rome to go to Spain, and then he would also bring his knowledge, his wisdom, what God has been speaking into him, into uh, the church. And there's a combination of theology and pastoral concerns. You know, one of the main themes was, you know, again, bringing the Jewish and Gentile community together, the church together as one. Again, last week we talked about this, not replacement theology, but as one body in Christ. So here's the themes of Romans. Okay, so we just talked about the reasons. Let's talk about the themes. Gospel. That's one word, the gospel. Paul's view is good news and his call to preach the good news. So he came in and said, I am going to preach the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1, 16 and 17 begins a theme statement, and we'll get to that next week. I don't want to read it this week and be redundant. But if you'd like to read ahead, go right ahead. But 1, 16 and 17 really begins the theme statement of what Paul's purpose to come to the church is, his theme purpose. So there's a horizontal emphasis. What do I mean by that? Horizontally, you guys all know what horizontal is in vertical. We're going to talk about horizontal and vertical. There is a Jew and Gentile relationship Paul wants to bring together which we know through the good news, and we know his ministry that Jesus gave to him, he was, uh, he was uh, dedicated to preaching to the Gentiles. So on a horizontal emphasis perspective, he wanted to bring Jews and Gentiles together. But there's also a vertical emphasis where God and the people relationship matter. So he's not only bringing bodies of people together, he's bringing individuals together to God to create a perfect sphere of God's influence and God's power and might and the Lord Jesus Christ in that sphere, being able to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. And let me state it a little differently, to worship God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. So this is some of the themes of Romans. So as we're reading and we're going through our sermons and, and you're starting to read Romans, really understand what Romans was about. Understand what Paul's objectives were. As we can see what his objectives are, we can understand the scripture a little bit better. And we get a better understanding of who Paul is, who Jesus is, who God is, and who the Roman church is. It's, it's exciting, exciting to be here. So scripture is fulfilled. Guess what? You can be a real friend to God. And this is something that Paul was trying to get in his opening statements. A friend, be a friend to God. Don't be a friend to me. Don't be an enemy. But be a friend. I'll tell you, the worst place you can be is a frenemy to God. That's the worst place you can be in because it reminds me of the church of Laodicea where God's going to spit you out because you are lukewarm. 
So let's look at this, James 2, 22, 23. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now, what's the point here? The point here is that when we follow God, when we trust in God, when we put all of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we become friends with God. We have a conversation with God, just as we would have with our spouses, with our children, with our neighbors. We can have those types of conversations. We can reverence the Lord in one hand and treat him as the majestic king he is, but we can also have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with him. And we can be his true friend, and he will always be our friend. May, many before us have answered God's call, and this Paul answered. This many of us have answered my question to you is will you answer when God calls if God has been calling you are you answering or are you hanging up are you blocking the number are you letting it go to voicemail let's look Isaiah 6 8 says this also I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us this is God asking and what does it say? Then I said, here I am, send me. This is Isaiah's response to the Lord. Here I am, send me. And I'll tell you, when Isaiah answered that call, some of the most prophetic, beautiful scripture comes out of the book of Isaiah. And just so people who don't know how Isaiah died, he was sawed in two long ways as he was alive. This was a sacrifice he made to serve God, to answer the call. Now, will we be persecuted like that? Probably not. But will persecution come our way? Will we lose friends and family members because they don't understand why it's so important for us to follow God and strip ourselves from the world? Yes. But we have to be prepared. Paul was prepared. The apostles were prepared. All but John died a martyr's death. It said that John was uh, died of natural causes because God's will was to have John have a vision to write the book of Revelation. But John was boiled in oil, and he survived. And we can go back to the Old Testament and the fiery furnace. Go back again to Daniel. Go into the lion's den. God will protect. Go back to last night. A hair's difference between death and save salvation. It's interesting when we take a step back and really view the power, the strength, the might of God, and His will will not be deterred. He is going to bring this nation to our knees. I suggest that we get on our knees first. And we willingly go on our knees and seek forgiveness and turn our face from the evil so God may heal our land. Second Chronicles 7.14, we need to be in prayer daily, multiple times a day. If the only thing you, that you can remember to pray, pray Second Chronicles 7.14. God is the only one that's going to heal our nation. I hear the pundits now starting to say, we need to come together, we need to fix this. We broke it, we can't fix it. Only God can fix it. Only through God's grace and mercy can we be fixed. And we need to start recognizing that. It's through God's power, His grace, His mercy, His love that He has for His created that He'll fix it. But we need to be willing to bring Him back in to our homes, to our hearts, to the land, so He can heal the land. 
Following Christ requires determination, as Paul did. Christ suffered, so will we. Guess what? Isaiah 53, 3 says this. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. You can't run from Christ. You can run, 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 but you're going to run yourself right into hell. At some point, you need to answer the call. God calls all of us. What does God tell us? He desires that no one shall per, uh, perish. What does that mean for you and I? That we need to change our lives. We need to start receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Old Testament fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus' prophecy is fulfilled from the Old Testament. Let's look at Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Everything is fulfilled. Jesus proclaims the fulfillment. The old prophecies were fulfilled. Now, don't misunderstand me. All the prophetic words in the Bible have not been fulfilled yet. Obviously, we got the book of Revelation where there's some prophetic words that still need to be fulfilled. But the prophecy of who Jesus is that was spelled out in Isaiah, in Daniel, in Zechariah, in the Old Testament, they have been fulfilled. The things that Jesus did on the cross have been fulfilled. The promises that he gives to us to live a richer, more fruitful life following him are being fulfilled. Let's look at our encouraging verse. Galatians 4, 4, 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God set forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So the fullness of time had come. God set forth his son, Jesus Christ. And again, what is Paul saying? He's born under the law. He was born from a woman. But he came to redeem us. He came to save us. That we may receive adoption. Adoption from who? Adoption from God. That we may be adopted into the kingdom. This is what God did for us. Along with his desire, he backs it up, God does, by sending his son. God tells us he desires that no one should perish. He backs it up. He has the words. Then he has the actions. This is why if you're being taught that your Christian life requires no action on your part, you are living a lie. And you need to correct whatever anybody's taught you. Our Christian walk requires action every day. It requires prayer. It requires reverencing. It requires glorifying God. Those are actions that are required. People are so afraid of saying work because they're misguided in their understanding of what James was talking about in Scripture. He wasn't addressing salvation. Our salvation is free. Jesus did all the work. But our relationship to grow and to strengthen and to get to a place where God wants us to be requires work and action on our part. And I just explain a few of those actions. Getting in your word, praying, fellowshipping, encouraging others. Those are all actions. Those are all work. You can use whatever pronoun <laughs> that you would like but it all results in the same thing. We're called as Paul was called. We need to be eager to answer the call to spread the good news of Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for your message. We thank you for your word, Father. Lord God in heaven, breathe new life into us, Father God in heaven, so we may be eager more than ever to share the gospel to share the good news, Father God in heaven. 
It's not because Paul did it. It's not because, you know, our friends or our pastor friends are doing it. It's because you have called us to do it, Father God in heaven. Light that fire. Reignite the fire in our souls, Lord God in heaven, to share you. Father, again, I want to lay this petition at your feet. I want to pray for President Trump, his protection, Lord God in heaven. And for those who are standing up now and openly saying they uh, want to support the president when in the past they were afraid of the backlash father you are in control of all things father you your hand is holding back everything lord god in heaven you are controlling all of these events because you love us father god in heaven and you know that it's going to take more than just words for us to recognize you. It's going to take action to get on our knees, to pray, to die to ourselves, to put these things that we call, you know, worldly possessions, uh, worldly points of view, to put them behind us, Father God in heaven, so we may just focus on you. We may recognize that you are on the throne. Recognize that you have won the war in, in every battle in between. So thank you, Father, for this. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for answering our prayers. And thank you for your protections and guidance. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you need a Bible, please reach out to us. We will gladly send you a Bible or 10 if you need more. Part of our ministry uh, arm in California, they're giving away Spanish Bibles right now because there is a need. And I'll tell you, we're, we're giving them out. We'll give them out when you call. We'll send them. If you need to contact me, www.ltsministries.org. Uh, my contact information is up there. There's a contact page you can fill out. Uh, get it to us. If you want the live sermons, obviously, you can go to uh, the website. There's a live sermon page here. And then if you want the recorded, you can go to Rumble, Love, Truth, and Spirit Ministries. You can go to YouTube, Love, Truth, and Spirit Ministries. And also, go to the website if you want to see, uh, see the sermons. Because sometimes... We get clobbered by YouTube, and they're not available, but you will always get them available through our website. So have a blessed day. May the Lord just continue to breathe life into you. May he give you an excitement to share the gospel, the good news, and may we represent the Lord the way the Lord is deserving to be represented with all glory with reverence, with all our hearts, minds, soul, and strength. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen.